Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. Access. Because when lives are at stake and conditions are challenging, clear communication is of the utmost importance. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And RescueSwimmershop.com, official high-quality apparel featuring the silhouette. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. The Axness PNG Wireless ICS System can bring cutting-edge wireless intercommunication system technology to any aircraft. The PNG system can be fully integrated into an existing ICS system or can be carried on and off as a mobile base station. They can go anywhere, at any time, on any aircraft. Plus, with the strongest and most robust waterproofed handheld on the market, this system can take a hit and keep working. Their wireless intercom systems are designed to enhance situational awareness through improved communication capability. This system brings superior noise canceling technology to eliminate rotor wash and engine noise from your ICS. The Axness PNG wireless system is currently deployed in more than 1,800 public safety, air ambulance, and search and rescue aircraft worldwide. I have personally used the Axness system in four different countries and on five different airframes. It is awesome. If you want more information, contact them today at axness.com. That's A-X-N-E-S dot com. You just make sure you tell them Quinny sent me. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, long line, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, REALRESCUE, R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q. Plus, they are offering another 10% from their partners, Petzl, and their equipment. All you got to do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast, The Real Rescue Podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. And 15 years ago, photographer and Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 526, Chris Razok, created an iconic photograph. This photograph depicted the silhouette of a helicopter rescue swimmer reaching down for an outstretched hand in need against the American flag backdrop. The image went viral and became a symbol worldwide for the rescue community and the people they help. Its wild popularity inspired Chris to launch RescueSwimmerShop.com, a web store offering official high quality apparel featuring his evocative image, The Silhouette. T-shirts, hats, patches, and stickers featuring the silhouette are available at RescueSwimmerShop.com, including the flagship design, So Others May Live. Follow Chris and his story on Instagram with the handle at RescueSwimmerShop. And if you are a rescue swimmer, support rescue swimmers, or just tell people you are one at the bar, this gear is definitely for you. When you get to the website, rescueswimmershop.com, enter the promo code, all lowercase, one word, rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, for 10% off your order.
In this episode, we get to do another asterisk. And I love doing the asterisk because it's outside of the rescue world that we normally hear from. And we get it like an inside scoop of some of the other areas in our field. Anyway, so this one is with uh, one of the guys from Onboard Systems. They're the company that makes one of the cargo hooks that are on the market, specifically like the dual cargo hook that everybody's starting to move to because of the FAA and other regulations that are out there, which is another part of the conversation that we get into. So please welcome our next guest, Mr. Mike Fox. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Real Rescue. And today, uh, we, we're going to do a little asterisk episode. We're going to learn a little bit about some cargo hooks and what it goes into with, with cargo hooks. Uh, we talk a lot about hoisting it on this podcast and what we do for rescues, but we don't talk too much about long lining and how we get into rescues. But even more importantly, we don't talk about any of the safety aspects of it. So I've got with us Mr. Mike Fox from Onboard Systems. What's up, Mike? Hey, Cody, how you doing? Man, I'm fantastic. Thanks for uh, coming on and, and joining me with this episode. And, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to learning some of this stuff, man. <laughs> of course, man. Let's talk cargo hooks. And I, I mean, I can speak hoist a little bit. I spent four years at Goodrich before I was at Onboard. So we can talk both. Okay. We can compare and then, yeah. and then throw Goodrich under the bus. Just I shall Goodrich. never speak ill of my former <laughs> employer. You got to you know, know that. I can't, I can't speak yellow and good I freaking love that hoist. It's ridiculous. Hey, I use it now. A lot of people do. A lot yeah. of people do. So, you know what? Good, good on them. But you know what? Cargo hooks in general and long line, you know, um, so I've done a little bit of training with some long line. I've hung underneath a couple helicopters and it's, it's been fun. But before we get into that, man, give us a little background about you, how you got into aviation, cargo hooks, hoist stuff. How, yeah. How did sure. all this start for you? Yeah, I mean, so I got into aviation, I guess, like any good story, I chased a girl. Um, and that's what led me into aviation. Yes. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. So, I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. Worked out. She's upstairs Perfect. with my two kids right now. So excellent. excellent. Um, well done, sir. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. So yeah, I was living in San Diego. I thought I was going to be a, a high school English teacher. That's what I went to college for. And uh Met a nice girl. The last class I ever took, she moved after college. I chased her with no plan. Um, but her dad ran a, a metal fab shop at an aerospace company that um, made final assembly lines for all kinds of aircraft. So he taught me to weld in his backyard over the course of the summer. And he got me a job welding aircraft parts and aircraft final assembly lines. And I loved it. And I never went back. So um, I spent 10 years working at a company that built final assembly lines for, from building aircraft. And then in 2017, I moved from there to working for, um, Goodrich for nice. the, uh, the rescue hoist business. So nice. Goodrich was a division of United Technologies. I'd done a bunch of work for them in the past, really liked working with that company in general. So, um, got my first taste of helicopter equipment back in 2017 and I'm sold. I'll never go back. Um, so I was at Goodrich awesome. for about four years. I, I did some operations management there, did a lot of program management and um, strategy kind of determining what products we needed to build for who and when. Um, and then the pandemic hit and like a lot of people, <clears throat> you do some soul searching and say, what do you really want to do? And we'd always talked about moving out of California and kind of getting outdoors in the Pacific Northwest. So an opportunity opened up at Onboard Systems, which is in Vancouver, Washington, just across the river from Portland, Oregon. Um, and, you know, from being in a helicopter external loads mission equipment business, definitely knew of Onboard, thought it was a great business. So jumped at the chance, moved up here in November of 2020. And it's been a fun ride since. So Went from hoist to cargo hooks, um, two great tools in the toolbox in terms of helicopter external load. So let's talk about them. Yeah, totally. And at, so cargo hooks uh, in particular, and there's a lot of changes that have been made, you know, with the cargo hooks in particular, because I mean, 
like you and I talked about a little bit uh, earlier is I was using it with one cargo hook and then a belly band going around the aircraft. And now you guys are going towards more like two cargo hooks with two release points, the whole nine yards, right? Yeah. So one cargo hook and a belly band was really the go-to formula for, you know, you're going to hang a human off of a long line up until probably 2018. And really the FAA stepped in and said, we need a certified solution for this. Right. that's more controllable than a, than a belly band. And so once a certified solution existed, um, you know, there were regs in place that said you had to have one before, but there wasn't equipment available to meet the regs. Yeah. But once there's equipment available, you have to use it. So <clears throat> there are a few companies now that make um, dual cargo hook HEC specific systems. So HEC is human external cargo. Yep. Um, so that really... Um, changed the the industry in terms of cargo hooks that were being used with long line applications for human external cargo. I think most fleets that are private um, between 2018 and 2020 um, turned over their entire fleet and went and installed um, dual hook cargo hook systems. And the reason really that um, we designed a dual cargo hook system is that the requirements to certify for human external cargo are a much higher level of safety and reliability. Right. And to get really the, the reliability um, that's needed per the regs, and because you got a person on the end of the line, you, you don't ever want anything to happen. Um, you need a redundant system. So <clears throat> the other big reasons are, you know, with a belly band works great, you know, when you first put it in, but it's a little fuzzy on how do you inspect it over time? How does right. weather impact it? How does sunlight impact it? It's a textile. So um, not super controlled. Um, it's not coming to you with, you know, instructions for continued airworthiness like a, yeah. like a certified system would. So that really um, changed on the civil side quickly because everybody who was doing power line contracts and things like that, they needed to, to get compliant to the regs. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, on the kind of parapublic side, you got a lot of police and fire departments who operate under public use, who, yep. you know, are still using a belly band. And a lot of them, it's because they don't know that there's a, a certified solution out there. So that's something that's been interesting in the last couple of years is kind of just turning over leaves and meeting operators that are, that are running public use, <clears throat> running under public use exemption. And once they know that there is an option available, most of them are going to ask for budget to say, hey, you know, there's a safer option for us if we're going to hang somebody out of a, off of our, our cargo hooks and do some long line search and rescue. Let's do it the right way. That's awesome. And actually, for people that don't know about what we're talking about with a belly band system, um, it's, it's interesting. Not every helicopter can actually use a belly band system because you have to have two doors. Uh, one on either side of the aircraft. So the belly band actually goes around the entire aircraft inside the cabin, out the doors, and then you have that connecting point, which is directly underneath the hoist up. Um, one of the other things that I thought was interesting as I got into this long line side of things is was the release mechanism based on the uh, belly band system. And <laughs> I remember this very, very vividly is the first one was just a pull toggle. And there are mm -hmm. three rings just similar to like a parachute release where you pull the, uh, you pull the toggle, it releases the pin or releases the, uh, the, the little plastic tab. And then that releases each ring, pop, pop, pop. And then boom, the whole thing falls mm -hmm. away. The other one, which I, I get, I was like, what is there is a block of wood underneath like the 550 cord or whatever the rope was there. And you used an ax to literally cut, the, <laughs> you know, you're like, okay, whoop out, and you cut it, and then, okay, now it's released. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me, right? Well, like, I mean, <laughs> it's not that far off from like the yeah. the garden shears that you got to use as the backup release for a rescue hoist, right? I mean, Very some of these true. things. Very true. Yeah, yeah but we, there are, are going to be yeah. better options soon. I know. I know the guys at Goodrich are working on better options than that, but like, um, yeah. yeah. 
kind of a trip though when you're looking at it like okay my you have an axe with a with a four by four block inside the cabin of the aircraft ratcheted to the floor that's your release mechanism yeah okay all right cool and you think <laughs> you know what's your reaction time to be able to do something like that it's yeah. it's nowhere close to what you'd actually need to avert something catastrophic so exactly you know with <laughs> like a dual hook system every hook has a primary release and a backup release so if yeah. something's going on with the primary release usually it's an electrical button and the backup release is like either a mechanical cable that you have like a t-handle that you pull or a hydraulic system where you just you know squeeze a lever yeah. um but you've got a primary and a backup on your, your primary hook. You've got another primary release and backup release on your backup hook. And the regs for human external cargo have those have to be like what are called dual actuated devices. So you have to like move a guard and then press a button or pull one lever and then reach with another motion and pull a second lever to, to activate a release just so that there's no inadvertent release. So yeah. You can kind of tell from those two like uh, comparisons of the release function where you're going to chop some wood with an axe <laughs> or you're going to, you know, like pull two hydraulic levers in two different motions purposefully. It's, it's a, a step change in, in safety. And I think that's, that's really why the industry has gone that way. And it's why so many, you know, so many operations that are flying under public use have gone that way as well, because the, the, uh, the safety improvement is, is so obvious. Nice. That's awesome. Now, for me personally, um, I have not done any long line actual rescue. What I've done is long line training for rescue. Okay. Um, I personally was working up in uh, up in your neck of the wood there, up in Washington and Oregon, and we were doing long line power line stuff. And basically what we went up there to do was to work on what happens when you have a guy that gets electrocuted on the power lines or something happens catastrophic where they only have the long line itself. I mean, those guys are using, they were using a 407. Mm -hmm. uh, we, again, we had one cargo hook and then the belly band. And if I remember correctly, the, the cargo hook had the main uh, line attached to it. And then there was like a, a secondary attachment point, which was kind of flopping in the wind, which was connected to the belly band. So if the cargo mm -hmm. hook released, we dropped about two or three inches and then we caught by the belly band and then the belly band would have to be released from there to be actually released. But that was our backup. Anyway, so what we would do is we'd come in uh, to the power lines and all of a sudden you're giving head signals, which is great, by the way, for anybody that has never used it, you do yes to go up and no to go down. You've got a big plus on your helmet. Um, and and the, the pilot is actually like his head's outside the aircraft looking down at you versus having somebody as a like a hoist operator conning you around. Anyway, so we come down into the power lines and you're coming in between power lines. You're hooking guys up releasing them from the power lines and then coming out. But that was our training. So that's what we're talking about. And it's, it was pretty gnarly. So do you, what do you know about all that stuff? Well, I think <clears throat> kind of like you're saying, one of the big differences with a lot of cargo hook, human external cargo. So long lining off of a cargo hook instead of, um, you know, being on a hoist, a lot of the difference is going to be, one, that you don't have the hoist operator. So the pilot is the one that's putting you in position all the time. And generally, you're talking much lighter aircraft. So it's mostly, you know, MD500s, Bell 407s, or 206Ls, or AS350s. I mean, those are the main players in the space. Some people are using 429s now. Um, yeah. But it's, it's mostly light single engine. So that pilot is your, your hoist operator, so to speak. Yep. Um, and he's just, you know, gonna have his head out the bubble window, <laughs> trying to put you where he's going to put you. Um, yeah. and <clears throat> you're, you're basically for the time that you're not either on a tower or on the ground, you are being positioned by, by that pilot, wherever he's going to put you. And, and normally you're talking, you know, for utility, you got like two ups and three ups that are, that are going up on these things, mostly right. two. Um, yeah. so or it's, two guys it's a lot in of, equipment. It's a lot, like yeah. it's a lot of weight. And th actually, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. This is one of the reasons why in comparison between the hoist and the long line, your hoist is rated for only 600 pounds or 550, depending on the hoist. Or if it's a smaller aircraft, you're down to like 300 pounds-ish, 250. Yeah. 
So you're like, oh, now with a with that long line, you're talking thousand, two thousand. Yeah, you've got some more miles. capacity than a than a hoist has um, for you know the same hook basically for non-human external cargo is going to lift three thousand pounds. But when you apply all of the safety factors for HEC, that hook is now going to lift 800 pounds, maybe 11 to 1200 pounds. So yes, it's going to be slightly more than a hoist could carry. Um, and, and that helps with, you know, getting two guys and a ton of gear up on top of a tower. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, um, you know, I, I know the the group and the aircraft that you're talking about in the, the training that you guys did in, in yeah. Portland and, and kind of a testament to, you know, operators seeing the benefit of enhanced safety through an actual like purposeful certified system for human external cargo. That aircraft doesn't run with a belly band anymore. They upgraded the, the equipment on the aircraft to have a dual hook installation from onboard and Booyah. they're doing their training now with that. They're getting a new aircraft from from Bell that's going to have that equipped from the factory. So oh, that's um, awesome. that really is the new standard for um, utility focused HEC. That's killer. You know, the other yeah. thing that we, we don't actually talk about too much is spy rigging as well. And spy rigging, for those that don't know, is a big long line connected to a cargo hook. And you're pulling, let's say, four, five, six, maybe seven guys out of the jungle and and what it is is you have this long rig and guy number one clips in guy number two and three four five and as you're pulling out of the trees you're just first guy goes up second guy goes up third guy goes up fourth guy goes up and now you're oh, cruising out it's it's a beautiful system to use but again we're all connected to your hoist or your cargo hook <laughs> yeah so, yeah i mean so when you talk about hoist and cargo hooks they're really, you know, two tools in the toolbox of you need to hang a person outside of a helicopter to do something. What's the best thing to use to hang them out there? Um, yeah. And I'd say, you know, a hoist for rescue is going to be probably the, the more precise tool to use, but you've got to have the ability to have, um, you know, a hoist operator. Yep. Um, you know, there, there are lots of departments that don't have an aircraft that would take a hoist even, or would maybe would take a 350 pound hoist, but they want to be able to do a two up rescue. So um, they may lean toward using a cargo hook for rescue. Um, the other thing that, that uh, a lot of people would consider when they're thinking about, can I have a, a hoist program? Should I have a cargo hook program? Should I have both is really how flexible do you want your aircraft to be, to be able to perform kind of a wide range of, of missions. So you know, if you've got an HEC cargo hook system, um, you can do a, a SAR mission. You can go do a construction mission right after with your primary cargo hook. Um, you can go do an ag mission right after with your primary cargo hook. You can come back and do some utility HEC. Um, and with a hoist equipped aircraft, you're gonna be able to do all of those human external cargo missions, but you've gotta have, you know, additional equipment like a cargo hook to do the non-human ones. So, um, what we really like, you know, being on both sides of the coins, they're both really good products. Um, a hoist is, I think, a bigger investment for an operation to take on from a training standpoint, from a maintenance standpoint, and from kind of a, a long-term financial commitment standpoint, because you've got a, you know, an extra crew member basically associated with that forever. Um, so it's a, it's a great piece of equipment. It's a precise piece of equipment. It's a fast piece of equipment, and it really minimizes, you know, the person on the hook's exposure outside the aircraft. So if I was going to go and hang off a helicopter to do offshore wind turbine repairs, there's no way I'd want to go out on a long line in the North Sea. It'd be an ice <laughs> by the time I get there, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah, so, I mean, being, being able to be in the aircraft until you don't need to be in the aircraft anymore is a benefit in a lot of, a lot of environments. So that's, right. that's something that a hoist gets you. Um, yeah. And then on the cargo hook side, I think it's, it's um, there's there's a cost effectivity aspect to it where it's just it's a cheaper system to um, procure. It's a cheaper system to maintain. It takes one less crew member, um, so you can do just you know single pilot and somebody on your on your hook doing rescue. Yep. Um, and <clears throat> I think it gives you a for for less of an installation cost. It gives you a pretty flexible aircraft set up to, to do a wide variety of kind of human and non-human external load missions. 
which I, I really like that too, because, uh, you know, well, let's talk about weight limits for a second, because you mentioned that a little bit earlier. And, you know, you said like, it could be 800 to 1000 pounds when you're talking HEC work, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the same cargo hook, if you put cargo on is rated at what? Like 3000 pounds. So it, <laughs> I laugh so, at this. It, this so is kind of I mean, funny. Like, yeah. This is the same cargo hook. I'm going to attach 3,000 pounds to it. But wait a minute. If you put a human on it, now it's rated only at 800. But don't I, you feel so much safer <laughs> knowing that now, Corey? I, you know what? I really do. I'm just <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And that's that's really just a factor of how the regs are written. Um, you know, And they're, they're written in a pretty conservative way for HEC, as they should be. Um, Which is awesome know. Yeah. to one set of it. But it... it it almost limits me. You know, I, I, I don't want to say that. That's terrible. I should, I'm going to say it, but I, I shouldn't, you know, I, I like the fact, I like that option that now if I'm a little bit over, like if I'm a little bit over 800 pounds, then I know that I'm going to be totally safe with a rating of a cargo hook at 3000 pounds. Go me. <laughs> well, as the, uh, the manufacturer and the, uh, the, the, certificate holder <laughs> for that equipment i can neither confirm nor deny <laughs> that you will be okay over the rated limit for atc but no, uh, I, I, I appreciate the book. i see your I, point yeah i appreciate the book answer that was a yeah. that was a correct answer <laughs> that sure was uh, <laughs> for everybody else that's actually doing the job you're safe how's that <laughs> all right that was for me that was for me just for me all right all right all right um that no that's awesome and now all right let's talk real quick about like regs and specs like how did you guys get into the specs and regs in order to make it the way it is now so i mean anytime you're going to produce aircraft equipment that's going to stay on the aircraft you've got to go and certify it to either um, an FAA or other regulatory body standard and you as the manufacturer can go get a supplemental type certificate and certify it yourself, or you're going to partner with an OEM that owns the type certificate for the aircraft and they've got a whole spec and they say, you know, we're going to have a cargo hook and it must do all these things. And all those things are going to be in order to meet their requirements and some regulatory bodies requirements. And so then they <clears throat> basically would roll a piece of equipment under their type certificate um, and certify it that way. So those are really like the two ways that get certified. One is purely to the regs. You're the e equipment OEM and you go get your own certification or you work with an Airbus, a Leonardo, a Sikorsky, a Bell, and they roll it into their aircraft certification, which is called a type certificate. Um, and really the, the regs that govern human external cargo is CFR 29.865. And it's not a long section of the regs and it is a, you know, um, hotly debated section of the regs in terms of how you interpret it. Um, but, you know, over the years you learn by working with the FAA, like we work with the FAA because we're in the US. So by working with the FAA, you, you learn, you know, how am I going to demonstrate compliance to these regulations in the design that I come up with, in the way that I test it, in the, the safety margins that I either calculate or that I, I you know, derive from a, a, a battery of testing of the, the product. And on the, the OEM side, you know, you're working with an Airbus or a Sikorsky or a Bell or a Leonardo, and they're basically putting together a, a 50 page technical specification that says, you wanna put a cargo hook or a hoist on this aircraft, it must do these hundred things to right. these, you know, tolerances or ranges or, or, or whatever is in the, the technical specification. And really, then that's, your, that's your, your roadmap to, I have to design something that will do all this, and then I have to be able to test it to prove that it does all of it. Um, right. That's really the, that's the path is, what am I going to design to, like, what requirements am I going to design this to meet, and how am I going to test it to prove to the person who I have to get a certificate from that I met those requirements? Man, that's awesome. You mentioned that you were working in the States, so you work directly with the FAA. What about the yeah. other countries out there, YASA, down in Australia, New Zealand? Um, I imagine that you cover those regs as well. That's yeah, we have a very international customer base. So 
It's, I mean, it varies country by country. Some countries take an FAA um, certification and say if the FAA approved it, that's good for us. Okay. Some countries, you have to go to their civil airworthiness authority and apply for what's called validation. So, you know, if I wanted to go sell a cargo hook that I got an FAA STC for in Europe, then I have to go and get validation from EASA. So you go to the FAA and you say, hey, I want to get this validated by EASA. They process it and send it to EASA. EASA reviews it and says, we agree. We'll, we'll give you a validation. Or they might say, we don't agree. So um, in, in, the, uh, in the hoist world, there, there was <clears throat> maybe is still a, uh, a very long standing difference of requirements and opinions between the FAA and EASA. And I know that there's a, a big working <laughs> group that's been working for years to get that hammered out. And, and it'll be good for everybody when they finally do. Oh, um, I hope so. I hope it works yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things that, you know, as we go through and we learn things, you know, that like, here's, here's a, there's a story that actually is on this podcast by Steph Mayer. So if anybody wants to go listen to that, it's pretty cool. Um, he had to do a long line rescue with uh, their 412 off the top of my head um, with a couple of guys that were stuck in a boat that had gone over the spillway. And the, and the boat was trapped and, and they debated on doing a hoist out, taking one at a time or going in with the cargo hook and the long line and picking all three people up at one shot. Well, because they weren't sure if they, as they were removing the weight of each person out of the boat, that the boat was going to then go down river. Um, so they went in with the long line cargo mm -hmm. hook and took, and it was three people, actually four, including the rescue men one shot out of the boat and then off to land, no problem. So that's some of the benefits that we're talking about. What have you seen and heard from stories that are out there that make or break you guys as far as how you create and the, the stuff that you guys do to make this stuff? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, we get, we tried to make operator feedback like the, the number one contributor to what we design and how we design new product. And we've got, I think we have around 80 STCs that we as onboard systems own right now, which means we work with operators. We saw a need for a piece of equipment on a platform. We went and designed a piece of equipment to go on that platform. We tested it, went to the FAA. We got it certified for a specific platform. So that's, that's kind of a, um, maybe a little caveat that we've got to take here is, I can take the same cargo hook and if I want to put the same cargo hook on a 429 and a 407 and a 412 and I mean, and, 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 and I have to go get a separate FAA STC for every single one of those platforms. It's not just like, well, it's on the 429 and it works, so it should work on anything. You have to go get a new <laughs> certification for every aircraft. I think most of people know that, do. but just in case. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, so that means 80 times we've worked with operators to, to say, okay, what, what do you want to do with the aircraft, with a cargo hook on that aircraft and what do we need to design around? So, um, you know, we've designed higher capacity hooks for, for larger aircraft where they want to go and maybe um, lift a larger human external cargo load. So like I'm having discussions with a, a customer right now who has a larger aircraft, um, can't say which one, but no worries. The larger aircraft, they want their their HEC um, minimum capacity to be like fifteen hundred kilos. So 1, I can't go put. Kilos. Wow. Yeah. Nice. So There's my three hundred you know, They want to be. Booyah. <laughs> they want to be able to go lift a bunch of people at one time to get them out of harm's way with a um, an HEC cargo hook system, and. So we're going right now and basically saying, okay, we've got this like heavier rated hook that we never thought we'd hang a human on because who would ever need a, a human cargo hook for, for that capacity. And we're tailoring some of the features on it to make it like an HEC hook. And we're going to go and work with, we're just going to work with an aircraft OEM, I think on this one and get it certified through them. Um, but I can't tell you, I mean, every, Every week we have somebody coming to us and saying, hey, I, I, wanna, I want a new cargo hook that does this, 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 and this for this specific aircraft because A, maybe there's not one that exists today or B, and this is the more common one, there is one that exists today, but it got qualified 30 years ago and it doesn't have all the tech that you've got right now and it's heavy and the you know 
the lead times are super long from maybe the person who makes it today and they want a, a different supplier to kind of step in and make a modernized version um, that'll be better supported um, from like an obsolescence standpoint and the customer support and all that kind of stuff. So it's hard for us, really, we've got to say, how many can we really do in a year? I mean, we go from an engineering standpoint and we say, how many projects can we work at any one given time? We can probably go and certify four or five products a year. And I've got a list of 25 long that customers want us to go and make. So um, that's a tricky thing. If you're an operator and you're listening to this and you're like, why isn't Mike at Onboard building that thing that I told them that I wanted or certifying that PCDS <laughs> system that I told them I wanted? Yeah. Um, that's why. Um, <laughs> we want to get to it someday. It's just not above the waterline today. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're trying to develop the things that we think will have the greatest like application to the most uses to the most operators so that we can kind of, you know, use our, our, our finite engineering resources wisely to bring the most innovative new products to the most new users um, as quickly as we can. That's awesome. You know, it's funny you say that. Well, I actually talked to, um, Mario Vatone at LSC and he gets all yeah. sorts of requests all the time. And he's like, I'm sure I can't do that because if I do that, it removes the safety aspect and it's only for you. Like it, it's not going to work for that operator and that operator and that operator. So it's <laughs> the yeah. requests that come in. Interesting. <laughs> well, and you know, the other aspect of that, I put myself in Mario's shoes. If, the change that somebody wants to make is on a piece of equipment where his, his hook, like say his hoist hook, somebody wants to change his hoist hook, his hoist hook is certified on, you know, a ton of Collins hoists and, or Goodrich hoists. And if he goes and changes it, like he doesn't own that certification, Collins does or Airbus does or Bell or Leonardo does. And so if you put a different hook on it, now you have um, a non-compliant, not airworthy <laughs> you know, system that now yeah. you're going to hang on. And if anything goes wrong, like Mario doesn't want to be involved in that. So right. <laughs> um, yeah. it's kind of like, that's, that's actually a good topic in terms of if you are, you know, an operator of, of a, a hoist or, or a cargo hook system for HEC and you've got, you know, changes that you want to want to see, or you, you, you would like to see something done for a specific aircraft that isn't done yet, or can you customize this thing just for this one aircraft? Um, we want to, like, I, I can tell you, Mario wants that feedback. I want that feedback as a manufacturer of the equipment because I want to know, you know, what do people like? What do they not like? What are some new challenges from some, maybe some new mission profiles out there that are driving us to, to design something different? Um, but then we might have to partner together with you as the operator and go, you know, maybe lobby the aircraft OEM to say, hey, this is a change that that these operators really want, because maybe I don't own the certification, maybe Airbus owns the certification. And if Airbus is interested in changing it, it ain't changing. So <laughs> um, we always, I mean, I always welcome that, that request for a new thing. Um, and I try to be honest in terms of, will we do it, won't we do it? And if we're gonna do it, when do I think we will? Um, I had somebody come, you know, about a month ago and say, hey, we want a new cargo hook for um, an AS365. And so we said, okay, um, you know, why do you want that? How many do you have? Well, I got 10 and it's like, okay, it's a big project for 10 aircraft. Um, can we go find more? So we like work with this, this, um, this one operator and he reached out through his network, built this big consortium of a lot of people who wanted this. And we were able to build up enough demand for this product to like justify that we as onboard can go in and invest in kind of the development of a new hook for this. Whereas, you know, he by himself, maybe that wouldn't have panned out. Just like Mario saying, hey, I, I can't make this because it's going to be just for you. Um, sometimes the just for you, sometimes there's a lot of just for you's out there. They just don't know that they're all asking for the same thing. So the more that we as manufacturers can kind of partner with the operator community and, and find out if there is a similar ask by a lot of people, um, then we can like bundle that together and say, okay, if we go and do this, there's a hundred people who need it. Let's go do it. Nice. Um, you it's actually it's mentioned it's to me earlier that you had a, uh, an interesting request from Air Zermatt. Like, 
with with the 429 and some of their yeah. stuff and it was like, going back to like yeah where yeah. the where the um where the request needs to be directed to um yeah. i remember being at so <clears throat> um oliver cruiser who's one of the hoist operators at air zermatt great dude um when I was at Goodrich, he used to present at the Goodrich Operators Conference every year. And I always loved his dynamic hoisting presentation and just talking to the guy in general, because it was like, he was doing the most extreme things and he was always cool as a cucumber. Like, it's all no big deal. I don't know what the big deal is. I don't know why people are so worried about this. <laughs> Go out there. Yep. Um, anyway, so he pulls me over at um, Helitech in Amsterdam and they've got an Air Zermatt 429 there. And he walks me over to the, the hoist pendant and he points to the, the coil cord that comes off the hoist pendant. And he's like, why is this coil cord so long? I don't understand it. It's like, like 10 feet long. It just hangs out the door. I shut the door on it all the time or I have to pull it back into the cabin. Like, why is it so long? I stand in the same place as the hoist operator. It connects to the wall here. I stand here. It could literally be two feet long and it's 10 feet long. Please change it. I told him that's great feedback, Oliver. We need to go ask Bell to change it. And we've got to get Bell's buy-in that it's worth their engineering time to go run through an engineering change to, to do this. And we've also got to make sure that where you stand as a hoist operator is where everybody else stands as a hoist operator so that we don't now make it too short. Um, but when we talked to Bell, really like what we found out is that, you know, somebody just said, okay, well, it plugs in on this front corner of the, the cabin and we want to make the cord long enough to stretch all the way across to the other opposite corner of the cabin just in case the hoist operator would need to go on with the pendant in his hand to the opposite corner of the cabin which no hoist operator really needs to do no. but you know <laughs> from an engineer standpoint sounds good so that's yeah. what they spec'd in so that's what we built um so it's interesting like the the, the feedback is great and then us as the 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 manufacturers of the equipment going in and, you know, ferrying that feedback to the aircraft OEMs um, and lobbying them to, to make some minor changes on things that are going to help operators is how we keep evolving things and making things better and easier and safer. So that's awesome. Love the feedback. Always want it. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I like getting feedback myself as far as um, just how to make things better. Like I like to give my feedback. Like I call Mario constantly like, Hey, I got an idea. And then he looks at me and says, no. And then other times he's like, oh, maybe. <laughs> so thank That'd you, Mario. Be, that's a great idea. I'm going to go do this thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's you, for Mario, it's usually a, that's a great idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, like you were talking about the, you know, making the cargo hook uh, higher rated for that bigger aircraft. One of the things that, that is out on the market, and I apologize to the company right now because I don't remember who it is, but they make a, a couple, and there's actually two or three companies out there that make a different one. It's like a, a Billy Pew type system. And it's this big basket or a net that holds like four, five, six, seven guys. Um, they <clears throat> designed it for moving like military personnel from one point to another and, and basically just below the aircraft that they can't land or can't get close enough to um, either fast rope or however, it's just a, a fast way to get in. They also were using it for firefighters to get in and out of wildfire areas where they oh, had- Oh, interesting. Yeah, so you got like this long line of, let's say 200 feet because the treetop area is like 150 so they can- bring five, six, seven firefighter guys plus equipment into this area and then hover to send down, drop these guys on. And I, I wish I could remember the name of the system. I really apologize that I, I don't know the company, but I've talked to them enough. Jeez. But anyway, so I, I wonder if that's part of it because they were talking about search and rescue with that, where if you had a bunch of people trapped on top of a burning building and you needed to get 10, 15 people off, you throw everybody onto this Billy Pew cargo thing and now you're you're long line of guys yeah off. i mean i've seen a few different versions of of what you're talking about um where it's like a you know a multi-person rescue basket basically yes um to do you know mass evacuations in in one shot um and i have a feeling that this higher capacity hec hook that is going to go on this um very heavy lift aircraft that you would never think would do HEC. <laughs> I have a feeling that's probably what they're going to use it for. Yeah. 
super smart. I mean, it's not a bad idea. It's, it's again, yeah. another tool in the toolbox to use. So, man, and I'm awesome. constantly surprised that like, just what people are going to use a cargo hook on a helicopter to do. Um, you know, that's one of the pleasures of the job is talking to people about like how they, they use even just a normal HEC setup to do some kind of mission profile that I had never thought that anyone would do. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. So I'm talking to <clears throat> this guy in Australia and I was asking, it was right when I started at Onboard and I was asking, you know, some customers because we couldn't travel, couldn't go see people. So I was doing a lot of these like Zoom meetings to get to know customers. And I'd always ask him, you know, like, you know, what don't we make that you need somebody to make for you? And, and he's like, oh, you know what? You guys need to do an HEC kit for an R44. And I thought like, that seems <laughs> odd. Um, and he's like, yeah, because there's a guy and he, um, he works on these alligator farms and he does HEC off of an R44 and he goes and flies the, they fly the helicopter over like a, an alligator's nest and they scare the mama alligator away and the guy gets dropped into the nest and he collects all the alligator eggs into like a giant bucket before the mama alligator runs back and tries to eat them and they pick him up just in time to harvest the alligator eggs. And oh I thought like, God, if that's not the wildest use of like an, a cargo hook HEC system, I don't know what is, but I'm, I'm constantly surprised and delighted on, on what people are using these for. Wow. Oh, that's, that's yeah. pretty good. I like that. <laughs> I forget the guy's name, but he, like there was a Nat Geo special on it and everything. You can go look it up on YouTube. I'll, I'll send you the link. Um, yeah, but it, please do. It's wild. It's wild. That's hilarious. I wonder if I can go down and do that. My wife is going to be like, no. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Man, well, that Should you go down and do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it depends if she's mad at me. Yeah, go do that, honey. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, wow, that's. Man, what you guys make and, and what they use it for is crazy. That's awesome. Um, what about Bambi bucket stuff? Is that with you guys as well, our cargo hook? Are they holding the Bambi yeah. buckets? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, a traditional non-human external load mission profile is bucket firefighting. Um, so whoever makes the bucket, we're kind of agnostic to that, whether it's a Bambi bucket, a dart bucket, a cloudburst bucket, whoever. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to name drop Bambi. In no, no, no. It's a, Bambi's like the, you know, they're like the Kleenex of buckets, let's be honest. Yeah, um, yep. So <clears throat> the the cargo hook systems that we build are used all the time with Bambi bucket operations. Um, and we've even worked with operators that say, hey, you know, I got this STC for a Bambi bucket and here's where it plugs into my aircraft. And I got this STC for your equipment and it plugs into the same spot. What can you guys work together and can you figure out how to make it so you guys don't both need the same power source for your equipment. <laughs> so, you know, there's a bit of overlap there, um, but it, there, you know, it's, it's a complimentary product to, to ours and um, is just one of like the many non-human external cargo missions that you can do with a, with a, a, a cargo hook system on your aircraft. Dude, I love it, man. That's great. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Mike, so you've gotten into some great stuff with regulations and specs and stuff that you guys are designing. You want good feedback. All right, let's talk maintenance for a second. What the heck? Like, there's warranty on this stuff. I want this stuff to work when I plug it in. I, I know that I shouldn't store it in the outside, in the dust and dirt. <laughs> what do I need to do? That's a good start. That's a good start, Quinn. That's a good start. Thanks, um, <laughs> I mean, we do sand and dust testing, so it still should theoretically work. Yeah. Um, Cracks, but, corrosion, <laughs> security. Those are the things yeah. I'm looking for. <laughs> you know, maintenance is always a topic that, that comes up because when you're maintaining an entire aircraft, every new maintenance operation is on top of 50, 100 other things that you're trying to do if you're a director of maintenance or you're a mechanic. So, um, you know, to touch on maintenance for, for a minute, and I could say this, you know, in a past life, in a rescue hoist business, and I can say this <clears throat> in my current um, role at Onboard for cargo hooks, the OEMs of the equipment put the maintenance task together because, not because we like want to ruin your day, it's because we want the equipment to work every single time that you need it to work the way that it's designed to work. Um, and, and there's a lot of analysis that goes into what and how often um, and there's also a lot of uh, field data and history on the products, thankfully. I mean, there are thousands of rescue hoists out there. There are thousands of onboard cargo hooks out there. And so we take all that field data and we're able to say, okay, 
These are the things that we don't ever see as issues. We can maybe dial back the, the maintenance tasks on that. These are the things that we see as, uh, hey, you know, this thing starts to wear right here. So let's, let's put a maintenance task in for that. So especially on, you know, more legacy products, the, the evolution of kind of the, the maintenance tasks that we ask operators to perform is because that's really what we see as the, the best way to get that equipment performing the right way every single time. And I can say like for onboard, it's pretty basic. It's, you know, clean it and put the grease in the right spot. And then every five years, send it back and, and we'll go through it and make sure it's good as new and send it over. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, if something's not working, you know, we get it back and we try to figure it out. And this is definitely not to pin any any blame on 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 operators versus us as the manufacturers. Uh-huh. You know, we sure got we got to right, we got to right. own our equipment. <laughs> but I, you know, there's a lot of stuff where you get it back and it's, you know, it's uh, have you ever cleaned this thing or put grease in it? Oh, no, 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 not really. Um, it's oh, like okay. you know, if you, if you bought a new car and then you drove it for fifty thousand miles and the engine blew up and you said, hey, you know, Honda, why did my engine blow up? And they say, well, did you change the oil? And you go, well, I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, you know. <laughs> There's a, there's a, a certain amount of uh, ownership we've all got to share when it comes to maintenance. So own we it. as the manufacturer, we'll take all the feedback. We'll take all the data. Um, we've got really smart engineers that are doing some really good analysis to say, this is the right maintenance frequency. These are the right maintenance tasks. Um, and really as an, as an OEM of the equipment, we just want it to work every single time and be the, the safest and high performing, highest performing equipment it can be. Um, and that's why it's so important. Um, I know that if you ask the good rich guys, they'd say the exact same thing. Like, yes, there are maintenance tasks you got to do. Cable conditioning, gosh, I can't tell you how many times people ask me if they could not do cable conditioning when I worked at Goodrich. Uh, do your cable conditioning, folks. Do it. It's yeah, save you lots it, of money in cables. Yeah. Cable conditioning, seasoning, however, whatever you want to call it, basically pull into a hover, extend that hook and cable all the way out and keep the tension all the way down. There's directions yep. in, uh, in, in the, in the book. Yeah. So, there's, anyway. there's not a shortcut for it and, and yep. it's there for a reason. Please do it. Yep. 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 That's, that, that's a, that's another topic. That's hoist topic. That's another one. Yep. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I don't have to answer that one anymore. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate the plug in for that. Totally. Yeah. Uh, good to know. Um, so every five years we're sending the cargo hooks back to you for inspection and then boom, you send them right. What's the turnaround time? For you guys um we average like about two weeks um oh, that's pretty good and if that yeah it's pretty good it's pretty good yeah yeah and if that doesn't and honestly you know we've if that doesn't work for you as an operator if if you you know kind of missed that in the planning of what you need for your aircraft and you're getting carded for fire season next week and you realize i got a hook that's passed you for an overhaul we have an exchange pool of almost every single hook that we make um where basically you tell us i need an exchange unit we ship it to you you put it on your aircraft, you ship us back your, your unit. Um, and that goes back into our exchange pool. It's the exact same price as an overhaul. We don't charge a premium for it. And it effectively eliminates term around time. So oh, that's awesome. do that with onboard. You can. Um, wow. Yeah. So, Very you know, cool. we try to, we also sell overhaul kits. If you want to do an overhaul yourself and you got the right equipment for it, which probably means you're a service center, but if, if you're a service center and you want to do some overalls and onboard stuff, we can tell overhaul kits, you can do it yourself. So nice. We've got do do regional service the military? Um, we actually are doing that right now. So we, um, we make the cargo hook system for the CH 53 K. Okay. And as they're introducing that aircraft now to the Marines, um, part of the deliverable that Sikorsky's got is they've got to, you know, train the Marines on how to maintain it. Um, so we're actually working on tech manuals and we're going to do some training with Sikorsky and with the Cherry Point Fleet Readiness Center, um, to teach them how to maintain their equipment, um, and, and kind of have those open channels of communication so that they can help themselves on all the the things that kind of we as the OEMs feel like they should be able to do. And there's a couple key things that'll have to come back to the factory, but by and large, they're going to maintain most of it. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, Mike. So how does everybody get in touch with you? If they have questions, comments, concerns, how do they do it? Mike.fox at onboardsystems.com. Cool. Email me anytime. And I'll put this out there for any of you uh, cargo hook HEC operators that might be listening to this. The best week of work that I ever had in my life 
was volunteering to be a, a hoist rescue dummy for a week of hoist training in Park City. If you ever need a live dummy for your week long long line training, call me. I'll be there. Um, it'd be awesome. my my honor to be there. You know so, what, man, I'll go too. You you and me yeah. go together. Yes. If you're gonna if you're gonna make the equipment, you got to put your money where your mouth is and hang on it as much as you can. <clears throat> okay, it sounds like a good time. I'm in. Yeah. Just uh, give me give me one story. What what did you do there? Like how how was the training? It was awesome. They shut down a ski resort in Park City. Um, it was uh, with with ARS, and they were doing a training with uh, a public agency out there. And basically, we commandeered the parking lot of a ski resort, and for a week, just flew an A star in, went and dropped people off different places, <coughs> went and picked them back up again. Um, <clears throat> there were times that you know we were the rescue victims. I went, and uh, one of my other coworkers at Goodrich went with me, and it was great because. You know, when they're doing training, normally it's guys that are, you know, doing hoist operation pretty frequently. And they just intrinsically know like how to shift their body when they get close to the cabin, things that make it easier to rescue them than it would be to rescue a freaking out victim that doesn't do this all the time. And um, I won't lie, like the first time up, I was the freaking out victim that didn't do it all the time. So they told me it was better training for them to have, have us there. And, uh, Did you try to climb up the that's skin? a nice way Is of saying that like, you guys do? freaked out about this, <laughs> but I mean, you know, after being hoisted 50 times in a week, it's like, uh, you know, like brushing your teeth. No big deal. Yeah. It was great. It was great. Oh, Mike, I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what? That's a good way to end this thing. And I appreciate that. That's good. Um, I look forward to you talking to you with you again. I appreciate you coming on here and giving all of us the information when it comes to cargo hooks. And I love what you guys are doing, dual cargo hook system. I, I know the FAA is pushing that and whatnot, but thanks for thanks for building all that for us, you know, keeping the safety aspect up there. And uh, of course, yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, awesome. It's been an honor. Sweet. And I'll, I'll catch up with you soon for sure. Thanks, and with yeah. that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here go. thank you for tuning in we hope you enjoyed this episode of the real rescue podcast please take a minute to like subscribe and hit that share button i'm pulling chocks and taking off but before i go if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share i would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here send an email to Jason at therealrescue.com. That's Jason at T H E R E A L R E S Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>